Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. Welcome to game week number one on the Penn State 2023 football schedule. We're looking forward to following this team throughout the season here at Lions 24-7, starting with this Saturday evening. West Virginia heads to town. The number seven Nittany Lions will be hosting them 7.30 kickoff, primetime setting. Big chance to unveil a highly anticipated uh, program uh, move here in 2023. A lot of people hoping it culminates with a trip to the college football playoff, but Long road to follow. We'll learn a lot more about West Virginia and what they're bringing here to campus with Chris Anderson, who covers the Mountaineers with 24-7 Sports. A little bit later here in the show, kicking off our full season of weekly looks at the oppo- opponent on Penn State's schedule. We'll start now with West Virginia, but we'll begin with what we just got out of was James Franklin's first press conference of, of the game week setting, uh, Tuesdays in Beaver Stadium, 1230. That's where we'll always be. And Daniel Gallen and Mark Brennan right there alongside me once again this Tuesday. And gentlemen, we do not have a starting quarterback name, but we have some interesting intel about Drew Aller coming out of this conversation. We also had James Franklin. Uh, aside from James Franklin, I should say we had two preseason All-Americans available today for conversation. Olu Fashionu during the morning, Kaylin King this afternoon. We were on each of those calls. So a lot of stuff to bounce around. But Daniel, you have a story up at lines247.com just as we were getting ready to record here. Um, No starting quarterback named on Tuesday. I guess that's a little bit surprising at this point, but it really feels like at this stage, maybe we don't get an announcement. We just get a a starter trying out into the field at at 7.35 p.m. on Saturday night or whatever it will be. But we heard a lot about Drew Aller, and and we got a little bit of that kind of curtain peeled back on what his preseason camp looked like against a very good Nittany Lions defense. Definitely. I mean, I think that part of us was was thinking and maybe even hoping that we would get this announcement today, um, you know, finally get it on the record and we can kind of put some of this speculation to bed. But it looks like it'll be a, a couple more days. But, you know, in, in talking about Drew Aller, uh, we can start with what James Franklin said. I mean, he had a lot of praise for the sophomore quarterback. Um, he said that he was doing a great job of taking care of the football uh, this fall, uh, Franklin said that Aller didn't throw his his first interception of camp uh, until you know the 13th or the 14th practice. Um, I think whenever you're talking about a quarterback protecting the football, that's something that you really like to hear. Um, Tyler, I know you were on the Kalen King call, uh, and he echoed that. Um, and then Olu Fashionu talked about you know, the types of throws that Aller can make. You know, he was asked, "What's the most impressive thing that you saw Drew do?" Um, during fall camp and he said that there was um, you know some a play a throw during a two-minute drill where Aller just completely threaded the needle to a wide receiver who didn't have any separation and uh, he said that that's the type of play that makes you really excited to block for someone like that so I think that you know this praise has kind of been building we've heard a lot about what Aller has been able to do in terms of becoming a leader you know we've heard a lot about his, his physical traits you know the you know, the arm strength that he has, that ability. Um, and it seems like that that has really, you know, expanded a little bit and his teammates have really taken notice. Yeah, the first thing I, th- I was thinking when James Franklin went on the record and said, you know, he made it to 13 or 14 practices deep before that interception. I think and if he's wrong, he's going to hear from that defense because that's a prideful defense under Manny Diaz is watching. If someone remembers, uh, you know, a, a big day of interceptions and in, in practice number three, he's probably going to be reminded pretty fast. I brought it to Caitlin King's attention almost uh, immediately after the press conference, and he said, yeah, uh, especially that that, fir- that opening stretch of practice, he said it took a long time for them to get a takeaway from him. He thinks they may have gotten a couple. He, he said one or two takeaways off Drew Aller by the end of preseason camp, and, and that started way back on August 2nd. So Caitlin King, a preseason All-American, he admitted that's a little bit frustrating. You know, His mission is to get his hands on the football when the quarterback's not putting you in a position to do that. Uh, he said – it's frustrating right now, but he says says very good things about where Drew is going to take this offense potentially in September and beyond. And I just want to go back to everything we've seen about Drew. We've talked about you know overshooting some receivers and some of these open looks and, and all those things, but never have seen him in, in any of our practice looks, and I'm including that hour plus extended practice period in mid August a dumb throw where you could qualify as, wow, that's an interception waiting to happen. I'm sure those moments have happened. Maybe he got away with some mistakes over the course of of August that that didn't end up as interceptions. But every time we've seen him, and that goes back to his 10 game appearances last year in in matchups, no turnovers, five total touchdowns, and different kind of scenario now to be the start-to-finish quarterback for Penn State. But, Mark, 
that's something that we keep hearing about him is the, the lack of mistakes, the lack of uh, the, the, the impressive ball security. And you combine that with the, the ability to stay calm under duress. These are the traits of legendary quarterbacks. These are the traits of great quarterbacks. We know he has the physical talent to match up with it. It's just about showtime. I know we haven't heard QB1 uttered by James Franklin yet, but we're getting a picture painted for us, it feels like, by teammates, by Franklin himself, of what it might look like when number 15 hits the field. Yeah, I'm not sure why James is doing this other than to, to mess with us because we all know who the starting quarterback is going to be. But, you know, as I was listening to him today, I was thinking back to, you know, it was two, two and a half weeks ago. I forget exactly which press conference it was. But, you know, we were in Haluba Hall, uh, and that's where James typically meets the media after practice. And he said something, I'm paraphrasing here along the lines of that he would ha rather have a quarterback who completes 65% of their passes with very few interceptions than 80% of their passes with a higher ratio of interceptions. And I think that's what we saw last year from Sean Clifford. And I think anybody who's looking at Drew Aller sees more of a total package as a quarterback you know, physically, size-wise, all of those things. And I, I think we're getting an indication of the way they want Aller to go about handling his business. Uh, you know, not necessarily being cautious, but he has the rocket arm that he's going to be able to throw into coverage, but I don't think you're going to see that constantly happening. You know, I think they're going to take, especially early in the season, I think you'll see safe throws. Uh, I think you'll see the short passing game. I don't think I'm giving away any secrets, but a lot of times, a lot of the things that we've seen at practice, they've worked a lot on different elements of their short passing game. And I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to say what they were working on, uh, but I think there's everybody, I think, expects that Drew Aller is going to come out and just start throwing bombs and throwing mm -hmm. bombs. And I think you're going to see him spread the ball around the field, be a little bit cautious, err on the side of overthrowing rather than underthrowing. And, and it just seems like the narrative that we've heard throughout throughout camp you know whether it's people talking to us directly on the record or behind the scenes is that Aller has just been outstanding and I think he's ready for a big big year and then the other part of that is always but man this defense is really good and they've made him earn it and they've they've sent him home with some tough days and he's got to stomach that but we've said it out loud maybe Drew Aller doesn't face a defense this good or better so you get into December. I mean, you got to just, you know, see how this all shakes out, what Ohio State and Michigan are going to be bringing to the table. But it's hard to find a, a defense that matches up with what he's seen on the practice field every single day, you know, getting all those number one reps uh, going back to spring ball. And and speaking of the quarterback situation in this offense, entering a new era, Sean Clifford was here for so long. We just became so familiar with him being the guy with the relationships with the offensive coordinator. This is year two between Mike Yurcich and, and both of those quarterbacks and Bo Perbula and Drew Aller. And the way that he's going to be communicating is going to be adjusting a little bit. It also speaks to another member of this coaching staff. Daniel, I know you want to provide those details because uh, that was something that popped up during Franklin's press conference on Tuesday as well. When when Penn State released its game notes for the West Virginia game on Monday evening, uh, it had the assistance and where you know, th their, I guess, assignments for the game, if they're going to be in the booth or down on the field. Um, you know, Mike Yersich in his first two years of Penn State uh, had been on the field uh, calling the game. He's going to be up in the booth now calling the game. And James Franklin said that there's a couple different elements at play. One of them is just the overall comfort. Uh, that Mike Yersich has, um, I think, you know, with the quarterbacks, with the offense, with with the players, and that you know he feels that in the booth is where he can see everything and he can call the best game. Um, that you know you can have the best view. Um, you know you can have you know more, I guess more space to spread out almost and just be more comfortable. Um, another factor that James Franklin brought up uh, is Danny O'Brien, who has been on the staff for the past few years as an analyst. Um, and got bumped over to being a graduate assistant earlier this year. You know, that means that he can be hands on with the players now. Um, and so then there's a level of comfort there um, between Yersich, O'Brien, Franklin, and the quarterbacks um, to allow to have almost another, you know, set of eyes down there. You know, someone on the sideline who can, you know, knows what Mike Yersich wants, has a good connection with him. Um, and you know, we've only heard good things uh, about Danny O'Brien. Uh, you know, from pretty much anyone, you know, Mike Yersich, James Franklin, Drew Aller, Bo Perbula, even Ethan Gronkemeyer, you know, hearing from those guys about Danny O'Brien, 
Um, you can tell that he's someone that they have a lot of respect for and a lot of faith in. And so, you know, his rise, his, you know, being in this new position is, you know, another thing that James Franklin has around him on the offensive staff. And it's something that will help Mike Yersich and allow him to take this different view. From some staff notes there to, to some roster notes here, uh, Mark, we hear some really good things about a pair of defensive prospects who we've been considered roster risers here in 2023. 20, we're going to see how it plays out going into the season. But Cam Miller at cornerback, a guy that we're not expecting to see start, we're expecting to see play a ton of defensive reps. He burned red shirt last year as a true freshman. Uh, James Franklin made it a point to say he's going to play four different special teams units uh, on the field come September. And, and oh, by the way, he also said that if Cam Miller's parents want to have another Cam Miller, he'll be happy to go back down to Florida and recruit them. And we've heard him address uh, different players in the past in Penn State like that. And they've been really good players in the field. So it makes me even more curious to see what sophomore year looks like. And then, Mark, the other name that, that keeps being brought up by everyone who will if, who you'll listen to, and James Franklin was singing his praises today, is Jordan Vandenberg made that freaks list. I know that caught a lot of attention nationally when Bruce Feldman puts your name down there. Uh, but, but we've been hearing internally, uh, you know, the Iron Lion recipient, one of the three on this roster for what he did uh, off the field in the weight room. His development, Daniel referenced that a little bit on our last podcast, I believe, how he's kind of transformed his body. And I know you can list three, four, maybe five names at defensive tackle, probably not five, before you get to Jordan Vandenberg as an average fan. But it just feels like he's going to force his way onto the field early and often. And, and I'm curious to see what that looks like come Saturdays, because the reports of what it's looked like on the practice field have been very promising. Yeah, I like when James makes these comments about, uh, you know, parents should have another kid and they should go to the Poconos and half of the media room is like, what is he even talking about? You know, and for, for people who don't know, I mean, the Poconos used to be known as like kind of the honeymoon capital. And if you've ever seen Dumber Dumber, you know, one of the greatest scenes where it, where it gets the uh, John Deere letter uh, talks about the John Deere letter uh, was at one of those places in the Poconos. But in all seriousness, with a guy like Cam Miller, you look at what they have at cornerback, and obviously you mentioned Kalen King, and you know on the other side Johnny Dixon, who's been around, and then you have Daquan Hardy, and I think those are your three key guys. But to be able to have a young, a young guy out there, in, in Cam Miller, who you know that they like to play a bunch of cornerbacks, and you know when they go into their nickel and their prowler and all these different things, they find places for these really good players to go and make an impact, and I think. That's going to be important. I think if you read between the lines of what James is saying, uh, you know, guys playing on all these different special teams, you know, it, they're not far away from having to lean on a guy like Cam Miller to be a leader in that secondary. Because I don't think Kalen – I mean, I think if Kalen King's healthy, he's been on the record as saying, you know, he's going into the NFL draft. Johnny Dixon is in his last year. And obviously Hardy is is at the end of his career. So they're going to need somebody to carry the proverbial torch back there. And it's good to see that somebody's uh, coming up. Vandenberg is a guy that I don't know how many times we talked about the D-tackle tackles. And I've always left somebody out. And I have to stop leaving this guy out because he's over 300 pounds now. He's still relatively new to the game. But when you look at what he's able to do on that freaks list stuff, the way he tests and whatnot – you know, they're not going to need that guy to go in there and play 45, 50 snaps a game. They have enough, enough depth that if you're able to unleash that guy for 20 snaps a game, I mean, that's going to be a problem for opposing offensive lines. And when you compare, when you uh, group, you know, what their D tackles have become with the D ends, you know, and now we're hearing about Jameel Lyons at D ends who, who's flashing. So you, you have the, the three big guys, uh, you, you have, uh, you know, multiple guys behind them and Fisher and uh, who am I forgetting? Uh, Van Over. I mean Van Over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're just looking at an incredible number of players and James said it a couple times today, but I think w when you look at this defense, I think Vandenberg is the perfect example of why this defense is going to be really good in the fourth quarter of games and why it's going to be really good in November. Because they have enough depth, knock on wood, there's no injuries. But he's kind of personifies that if they do get bumped up, he's going to be a guy that can just plug in there. And if they stay healthy, again, you can unleash him for 15, 20 snaps a game, and he's going to do some damage for you. 
before we get out of the trenches, uh, spent some time with Olu Fashionu this morning. I, I was about halfway through the call when I called it quits. Uh, my kid's home today, uh, sick from daycare. I was getting slapped around by her snack cup while I was asking Olu the first question. I didn't make it to a second question because she made sure uh, Meltdown City uh, didn't let that happen. So, Daniel, you, you, you stayed on for the full call. What was your biggest takeaway from hearing from what many believe to be the top NFL draft prospect on the offensive line in college football? It was, it was kind of a, a funny call with Olu because I think it took about five or six minutes till we had the first question that was actually about him. Um, you know, your your top NFL prospect who could have left last year and been a high pick decided to come back, um, but pretty much went right down the line uh, on that offensive line to you know get Olu's feedback on his teammates and obviously you know. He's only going to say good things, but you know he does seem genuinely excited um, to play alongside some of these players. You know, he talked about JB Nelson uh, as someone that it, it appears he could be starting next to on that left side. Um, you know, the job that JB has done since coming to Penn State to put himself in this position to contribute, you know, with what he's able to do. Um, I thought that Olu's comments about Hunter Norzad uh, were pretty interesting. You're talking, you're losing a center, you know, in Juice Scruggs, someone who had been around the program for a long time, definitely had the respect of his teammates, grew into a leadership role. Um, but Olu said that with Norzad moving from guard to center, taking over that that vocal position, that there hasn't been a drop off at all. Uh, I think he said he was proud of uh, the job that Norzad has done and kind of picking up that torch, um, you know, making that seamless, being able to communicate. Um, and so I thought that was, you know, interesting to hear. And I think good to hear for Penn State fans when you talk about, you know, that center position. I think that in terms of more underrated guys that you lost last year, I think G Scruggs was one of them um, because, you know, Sean Clifford obviously was the vocal leader at quarterback. But the center has to do a lot of talking to a lot of communicating, get that offensive line. Um, you know, where it needs to be, you know, sliding the same way. But, you know, Olu was asked to kind of, you know, evaluate his career, you know, up to this point and, you know, look ahead to, um, you know, what he wants to prove this year. And, you know, he talked about, you know, not really having expectations for himself. Um, I think that's a very common thing that we've seen with all these Penn State players, the common refrain of that, you know, from team success comes individual success. But, you know, Olu said that he believes that his tape this year is going to speak for itself. Um, he's focused on the, you know, 1% better uh, mindset. And you know, he gave a lot of credit to Chuck Losey and Phil Troutwine for, you know, the time and the resources that they've really invested in him uh, to develop him and get him to this point where he is seen this way. Um, you know, by evaluators both in college and the NFL. So, you know, he sounded like someone who is you know, really excited for the season, really excited about the group of linemen that he's playing alongside. Um, and I'm, you know, really curious to see how this translates to the field. But I think he's ready to go. Yeah. And, and from one of the more important veterans to news on some of the newcomers on this roster, James Franklin, uh, during the opening statement at, at Penn State's press conference today, uh, shed light on some of those guys that have earned green light status uh, coming out of preseason camp, which means freshmen that they fully anticipate will burn red shirt this fall. Uh, all four of them on the defensive side of the football safety king, Mac cornerback Zion Tracy and Elliot Washington and then the linebacker Tony Rojas really if you followed our coverage here at lines247.com on the podcast as well these are names that have come up shouldn't really be surprising but Mark we also have scoped out a lay of the land with what else might be in play with this freshman class starting with September 2nd and moving forward and there's a few other names on there especially when you look over uh, towards the offensive side of things and, and another defender yeah, I don't know if it's official, uh, but I think Jameel Lyons is a guy who's you're definitely going to see. I think they're calling him a go, and I think Jevin Williams over on offense, uh, you know, he they're going to try to play him uh, to get him snaps because you never know when you're going to need that fourth offensive tackle. I mean, they're in a position now where you have Olu, and we're hearing all good things about Caden Wallace, and then what are we hearing about Drew Shelton that? He's done a really good job at being able to be a backup at either one of those spots. But what did we learn from Drew Shelton last year? That you better have some, you know, your fourth guy better be ready to go. And he's sure looking, depending on what the deal with J.B. Nelson is, right? Exactly. And so it, it looks like 
you know, Landon Tangwell may be out for a little bit. We don't know for sure, but just the sense that we're getting is that it may be a little while until he's back. And if that's the case, I think you need J.B. Nelson at guard. So now what do you do? And that's where I think, even though he's not officially a green, I think Jevin Williams is going to be one of those guys who is with the varsity, is going to travel. If they have spots where he can play, they're going to play him because face it, look at this kid physically. He looks like he's a junior. I mean, and that's saying something for these offensive linemen. I think it really benefited him. He was already a pretty big kid, but for him to get in mid-year with the frame he already had and to just build on that under Chuck Losey and staff. So I think those are two other names that that from everything I'm hearing, they're, they're, they're goes. So maybe they're not official green lights, but there goes. And then the other cool thing, I, I, I liked what I heard from Franklin about the DBs is that they plan, and we, we had got a sense of this as well, that these are going to be guys that they unleash on special teams. And I think that's terrific because we're hearing about the athleticism and the toughness of these guys. And to have those kind of players, you know, on special teams, number one, it gets them reps. Number two, if you have regulars that, that maybe you don't want to put into those situations, you know, in years past, maybe you had to go with more veteran players at some of those spots, guys who play like every down. Now you don't necessarily have to do that. And I think that speaks to the depth. And then Rojas, I mean, we've heard it from, from, from off season workouts. You know, the guy came in here at 195, 200 pounds, has built himself into a 200, 225, 230 pounder. And to me, you know, I think, Missing the spring was tough for Tyler Elsden, but I, I look at Rojas and, and he's looking to me like the 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 third, second, third or fourth, no third or fourth, you know, f- right in that area in terms of, uh, of the, the talent level at linebacker. I think obviously you have the big two uh, in Abdul and uh, big dog Curtis Jacobs, and then Kobe King. I think has differentiated himself a little bit in that middle spot. But I think Rojas is right there, and I think he's a guy you're going to see a lot as a backup linebacker and also on special teams. And, and uh, you know, just a few other names that we'll be monitoring. I'll have a piece up on, on lines247.com this week about uh, some, some freshmen that we should all be monitoring in September for our VIP subscribers. But, you know, look at that offensive backfield. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of room for opportunities. But September, the way the schedule lays out a little bit here in the first half of the season – there should be some chances maybe to see some of those freshmen, London Montgomery, Cam Wallace. What do they do with those opportunities? I mean, that that really could present different pathways for them moving into Big Ten play. Or, you know, maybe they should exhibit they're not quite ready for that stage and, and they get tucked away in the practice field. And I'll also put Andrew Rappelier's name, name in there, you know, a guy who's in the position room that doesn't really lend itself to a true freshman making a rapid rise, especially a guy who didn't get to campus until May. But we, we've talked about the size, the way he moves that size on the field already as a freshman. And he's one of those freshmen who still had his regular number uh, when we see these t- when we saw these teams break into varsity and, and JV. Uh, probably the best way we can describe it with the scout team forming here with the game week. So uh, a few other names there, but uh, James Franklin on the record with, with some of those guys and, and guys like Elliot Washington and King Mack, by the way instantly became some of the fastest members of this roster once they set foot on campus and they have shown that uh, translated onto the field with their work. Uh, we'll keep monitoring that. And, and, and we've got a bunch of stuff to get into in terms of topics that uh, preseason topics that we wanted to address on the podcast, a six pack of questions uh, for uh, the season opener, not specific to the season opener, but more about this team at large. And we'll begin with Mark going first, then we'll work our way in a bit of a rotation and question number one here. And if you've been following our round table series at lines 24 seven, we're, we're kind of double dipping right now uh, from that, but what is the biggest question mark for the Nittany Lions as they enter the 2023 season? Yeah, I think it's the place kicking game. I, I think without question to me, uh, you can look at some other areas. I had the first pick on this one and I went with place kicking just because not only do you have to break in a new place kicker, but a new holder and a new snapper. And, you know, who's going to emerge uh, you know, we're, I, I still don't think we're com- entirely sure, uh, what, what's going to work out. I wouldn't, it, from my perspective, I wouldn't be surprised if Sanders to just from what we kind of heard from James Franklin and, and again, keeping our ears, ears to the ground, uh, you know, he's the one scholarship place kicker that they have. Uh, and I also mentioned him in, an, in, in another, uh, area that we have, but I think just having all of those different pieces, 
you know, we've, we've been there at practice and we've seen some of the things that they've done to put these kids in high pressure situations, whether it's rushing the field goal unit out there, you know, with, with no advance notice or whether it's having two field goal units going at once or whether it's a kicker kicking and James Franklin yelling in his ears and waving it. All that's fine. But when you're in front of 110,000 people on national TV at Beaver Stadium against West Virginia, that's an entirely different animal. And you're depending on your first year snapper, your your holder, and your kicker to all get it done. So to me, could this go smoothly? Sure. I mean, maybe these guys are all wired in a way that it is going to be just like practice for them. But I just think there's so many variables there, so many things that could possibly go wrong, that to me, that's the biggest question mark. Uh, I got the second pick here, and and receivers seem to jump off the page and say, pick me. But I'm coming back to the, the guy that, that receivers are going to be depending on quite a bit this season, Drew Aller. I mean, and doesn't it ultimately so much of what we're talking about, uh, this launch pad that's in place for Penn State in 2023, and maybe how that could carry into 2024, and what it could mean for this program in an era where you want to seize the moment with NIL and recruiting opportunities, but it really – comes back to that arm and that brain of number 15. We know he has the six foot five, 240 plus pound frame. And it's only a few guys in every recruiting cycle, if a few guys who are going to have that kind of physical talent and have that kind of tangible evidence of production on the high school field, like he had and getting it done in all those elite 11 camp circuits. And we got a nice peek at him last year, but uh, look it, it 10 games. That's great. But they were scattered in different moments. He, he kind of had that. Whoa. Welcome to power five football moment early on against Purdue in the second half where that game is obviously hanging in the balance. And we're wondering what's going on with Sean Clifford. But beyond that, it, it was a lot of situations where it's a, a relatively controlled environment because your offensive coordinator is calling a game where you're up by several touchdowns. It's later stages. You might not even have a lot of those first team guys on the field to gain that chemistry with. So I want to know what this whole offseason of work have looked like for Drew Aller. It sounds like he's been a bit of a ringleader in getting offensive weapons together for a lot of uh, away work from the facilities uh, uh, during the summer, away from the coaching staff. And, look, he faced this really good defense, and, and, and you'd think that he's going to come out sharp against West Virginia. But you mentioned it earlier, uh, I think, Mark, and, and the, the recipe probably for Penn State is to not make him throw the ball 30-plus times per game early on in some of these games. You've got Nick Singleton. You've got Catron Allen. It's experienced offensive line. they got the weapons at tight end. And we'll see what they have at wide receiver. That's a big part of the equation here. But ultimately, to me, whether they get great play out of their wide receiver room or good play out of their wide receiver room organically, the best remedy for a kind of a ho-hum receiver group is a fantastic quarterback. You know, Hall of Fame resumes have been built in college football and in the NFL by receivers. who, if you paired them with an average quarterback, you're not going to hear much about them. We'll see what Drew Aller can do to elevate the, the rest of this offense, and including the wide receiver group. But uh, we've seen that it's a bit of a – it's not a 100% proposition, five-star quarterbacks showing up and looking like five-star quarterbacks. It could take till his junior year. It could take till November. It could take till 2024. Maybe he never finds that five-star recipe in Power 5 action. But in my opinion, that's at the crux of so much of what Penn State is capable of, of accomplishing right now in year number 10 under James Franklin. And Daniel, you got the third question. Sorry to leave you hanging. <laughs> <laughs> no, those are very, uh, very impassioned to look at, at Drew Aller and, and what, what's ahead for, for him right there. It could um, take yeah. him one quarter to do it as well. Too. I just <laughs> exactly. Throw that out exactly. <laughs> one play, one drive. <laughs> um, yeah, I looked over I, for my answer to this one. I looked over at the defensive side of the ball. Obviously, that's a unit that should be one of the best in the nation. There's not a lot of holes in it. You know, we've talked about you're losing two draft picks from that secondary and you know, inside the program. There's a lot of confidence that Penn State will still be able to be in a good position to succeed. But still, in losing Jair Brown, you're losing the engine for a lot of your turnovers these past couple of years. You know, James Franklin has talked about it where, you know, Tig was one of those guys who just kind of always ended up around the ball um, over the past two seasons. Ten interceptions, three forced fumbles three fumble recoveries, one interception returned for a touchdown, one fumble recovery returned for a touchdown. You know, that is really, really high level production in the secondary. And you know, there's guys that we've heard good things about, um, you know, when you're talking at safety, you know, Zaki, Zaki Wheatley was the takeaway king for you know pretty much all of last year. And we saw that early in the year um, before that tailed off a little bit. 
know, this year, James Franklin has already talked about Keaton Ellis, you know, seeing his ball skills when he was a, a wide receiver and a cornerback um, at State College High School, uh, you know, and early in his career, seeing him around the ball a lot, you know, wanting to see Ellis, you know, get back in there. Um, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that goes in the secondary. You know, Kalen King is someone who's established himself as you know already having good ball skills. He had three interceptions last year, but without Joey Porter Jr. on the other side, you know, it seems like now Johnny Dixon, Cam Miller, maybe Daquan Hardy, you know, they're going to be seeing a lot more opportunities. So those are guys that are going to need to step up and create some production there. So you know, we know that Manny Diaz's defense is really predicated on forcing turnovers, and Jair Brown was a great fit for that. Um, But for this defense to perform at the level uh, that it's capable of, Penn State needs someone to step into those shoes and force those turnovers. And again, that's, this is the biggest question mark, not necessarily the biggest concern we have about, about this program right now. But those are our thoughts. Uh, and we'll get to our second question now, which I'm going to lead off for the answers. And that is, what is Penn State's biggest strength? And you know, when you're talking about the number seven team in the country, you can point to several of them. But I went with what I feel like is a bit of a perceived weakness, maybe overall nationally, when people kind of just you know, take the thousand foot view at, at what Penn State is in 2023. I think the the sting and maybe the stink of what happened last year in Ann Arbor is still with people. But the defensive line to me is a strength. And, and I'm really unwavering with my view on that. I know some people, again, have pointed to it and as, as maybe a concern for this team. But they've got nine guys back on this defensive line who played at least 170 snaps last year. You lost two in the mainstays, I guess you could say, the last couple of years off your defensive line. And P.J. Mustafer, really important cog of things as a, as a leader, multi-year team captain, and Nick Tarburton. But I think that when you talk about replacing them from a production standpoint, you know, that, I don't know if that's a huge task for you to accomplish this year with the personnel that Penn State has, with the talent that they have in these rooms. I guess the question is, where does Deion Barnes find the right rhythm? Where does he find the right balance in, in being able to say, well, I, I just need certain guys out there for a longer leash? I, I, I love this rotation. I love the idea of going six deep at these posi- at, 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 across the board at different positions. But can you really pull that off consistently into big 10 play? And I think that's why the defensive line is going to be a strength for them because you will have injuries. It's it just, it's what's going to happen. And you'll probably have some guys not fulfill the preseason expectations, but that volume of bodies and, and, you know, maybe you have a wild card player like Jamil Lyons entering that mix or a uh, Caleb artist makes a big step here. He, he, he's, he's done some good things on the practice field in year two at defensive tackle. But I just think you can go through so many guys who've already done it in big 10 play they're now and physically different than they've seen them. We've seen them before in Hakeem Beeman and Kazaya Izzard and, and Zane Durant and, and Deny Dennis Sutton. And it's just to me, there's too many names that you list off and you say you can hang your hat on what you're going to get out of him this fall. And when it's that many names, this is an obvious strength. And I think it's the strength when I look at the Penn State situation here. Daniel, you've got our number two pick. Yeah, I went with a little bit of a different tact here. I went you know, off the field a little bit. I think that Penn State's coaching staff is its biggest strength right now you have the continuity in bringing back all three special team all three coordinators offensive coordinator mike yersich defensive coordinator manny diaz special teams coordinator stacy collins Uh, it's the first time james franklin has had all three back since the 2017 season Um, i think talking to the defensive players about manny diaz i think that he is someone that they really enjoy playing for uh, and that you know they're you know, prepared to kind of take a leap uh, with him. And then you know, we talked about Mike Yersich a little bit earlier with his comfort, um, you know, having Danny O'Brien around him, you know, that, you know, being willing to go up to the booth um, to, you know, leave the sideline. I think that that speaks to the comfort level there. And then I think the staff as a whole, you know, James Franklin has had some guys stick around that, you know, might've had opportunities to leave or people that we didn't necessarily think would be here for that long. You know, Jaywan Sider and Anthony Poindexter, I think, are the two that stand out there. You know, those are two very well-respected uh, coaches within the program. You know, you can tell that their players really enjoy playing for them, enjoy being coached um, by them. You know, you've had people like Phil Troutwine stick around and come into his own. Ty Howell, I think, fits that bill, too, as, you know, after a couple of years, really getting their rhythm, knowing what they're doing, developing these guys you know, Terry Smith has been a stalwart um, on the staff. And then even the new pieces that you brought in, you know, Marcus Higgins was very, very well respected when he came over from Virginia. Um, and I think that hearing that early feedback 
um, not only from the wide receivers, but from Terry Smith and from some of the defensive backs. Um, I think that the early returns there are promising. And then Deion Barnes was an internal hire after spending three years as a graduate assistant with that very brief period where he was switched over to an analyst. Um, you know, I think that he is someone that is a is a riser in this profession and is someone that can have a really, really long career as a defensive line coach. And so, you know, I think that you look at the staff as a whole, and I think James Franklin has done a good job constructing it. And then even then when you expand out to the analysts that he has, to the recruiting infrastructure that he has, you know, I know that if you asked him, he would probably say that he would want more uh, in a couple of these areas and that he always is looking for more. But I think that the investment that Penn State has made, I think really has the potential to come through and really be noticeable this year. Mark, round us out with uh, Penn State's biggest strength. Yeah, I just want to be clear that uh, Cal Veruso took the running back, so we're, we're not ignoring <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the yeah. running back room. So I just want to did make include sure. Tyler Cal Veruso. Yeah, yeah, it would have made and, for a little too much on the podcast, but yeah, he, he took running yeah, back for and, this and, one. And for, for obvious reasons, I don't think we have to go through and, and, and explain <laughs> that. But I went with the secondary. You know, I, I I completely get the idea that you're having to replace Jair Brown and. It's almost like an afterthought with Joey Porter Jr. now. You know, people aren't even talking about him, but those were two really good players. But I still think I'm not going to go through the list of everybody who's coming back because we've already discussed just about everybody. But I know you're the snap count guy, Tyler. The, uh, the cornerbacks, they're returning about 1,400 snaps at cornerback and about 1,300 at safety. So these are guys who have played a lot of football in, in big game situations, you know, some not big game situations, but obviously all of these guys have been out there in crunch time. And that's not even getting to the three freshmen who are playing so well in the secondary that they're being green lighted. So I just look at the, the, the level of depth that, that Terry Smith and Anthony Poindexter have been able to develop at both of those positions And I think we know with Manny Diaz, you know, the thing I love about Manny Diaz is when he has that much talent in an area, he's going to figure out a way to use it. And I just thought it was really cool. The last practice we were at, you know, we saw Manny Diaz teaching the defensive backs how to rush the passer. You know, that's the detail that this guy gets into. You know, obviously other positions were doing it as well. But when they were going through group stuff, you know, they're going up there against the bag and he's teaching them footwork and all this other stuff. So I think with, with, with the way his prowler package works, or at least it worked last year, even though you're not going to have Jair Brown, I think they have enough very talented, versatile players that that secondary is going to be a gigantic strength for them. We've got West Virginia insider Chris Anderson coming up in about 10 minutes, but we're going to finish off uh, with with a few more questions here. We'll try to get a little more rapid. I know that I can go long on answers. Everyone knows that. No, Uh, Daniel, (laughs) you're starting out with with question number three. Which Penn State player is flying under the radar right now on August 29th, 2023? Yeah, I went with uh, one of the more underrated members of one of the strengths that we talked about uh, on the defensive line. Um, I think Amin Vanover is someone who is in position to Mark really forgot his name. <laughs> Mark forgot to mention him. Perfect. There we go. Yeah. I mean, we've been hearing a lot about Zariah Fisher over these past couple of weeks. So maybe uh, Fisher would have been the, the better pick here, but yeah, you know, I've really liked what I've seen out of Amin Vanover, you know, these past two years of covering the team. I mean, he's a little bit of a thicker defensive end, um, but that has some, some twitch and some wiggle that I like. Um, but you look at what he did last year. He was their number four defensive end. Um, he actually outsnapped Deny Dennis Sutton and finished. And he had good production, 16 tackles, but then more than a quarter of those are tackles for loss with four and a half, and he had a sack. Um, so I think that he's someone that when he was on the field was able to be disruptive, um, be in the right spot. And we know that Penn State is going to want to keep that top three of Adisa Isaac, Chop Robinson, and Deny Dennis Sutton really, really fresh into the fourth quarter of games so that they can really make things happen. So I think Amin Vanover really has a great opportunity to improve on his production from last year, occupy a very valuable depth role, and make some plays. Mark, you got the second pick for this one. Yeah, I went with Jalen Reed. I mean, it, it was amazing. Sometimes you do these things and, and you uncover stuff that you didn't even realize. And, uh, I mean, he played so much more last year than I even remembered. 
Uh, he didn't start a game, but he finished second in snaps among the safeties. And so what, what does that tell you? That tells you the amount of confidence that Poindexter and Diaz have in this guy, that he was out there a lot, and that was with missing the vast majority of the Rose Bowl with an injury. So he's a guy who, you know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and project him as a starter. Uh, I think he will be one of your two starting safeties. And even if he's not, we learned last year that it doesn't really matter because he's going to play an awful lot of football. But he also had one more tackle than Kalen King last year. And Kalen King was like 557 snaps. And, you know, this kid was 300 and some. So I know quarterbacks by nature aren't flying around out there making a ton of tackles usually. But I think Jalen Reed is just a guy who we're talking about all these other players in the secondary and, and all these players on defense who are, you know, potential first round draft picks and, and this and that. But I think this guy has been a steady force for them back there. He's a really, really intelligent football player, uh, tough, tough kid. He's athletic enough. I don't think he's a high end, you know, like some of these other kids running four threes. But I think he's athletic enough, so I think he's a real key player for them in that secondary, and I think it's going to be reflected in the number of snaps he sees this year. A lot to like about the safety room at large, and, and I'm going to go uh, with another defensive back. I thought you were going to go Tyler Warren, Mark, because I know that you've been you've been talking about him for a while here and, and about that being that kind of guy going under the radar a bit. But I am actually going to go with defensive back Johnny Dixon. I think you could probably throw Daquan Hardy in this category as an underappreciated veteran with this team, but. Dixon has made such strides year to year to year since coming over from South Carolina earlier in his college career that I, I'm, I, he's one of those guys that I, I just think he's going to be one of the true stars of this defense in terms of who seems to be around the ball, who's making plays, not just downfield and pass coverage with, with, with a, a more propensity this year, I'd imagine, but also a guy who's getting after it in the backfield. I, I love what Johnny Dixon brings near the line of scrimmage. This Prowler package is, is, is something that we could see him utilized more with. And him and Daquan Hardy, a little bit interchangeable, uh, some of that slot coverage, but Dixon is a different athlete than Hardy. I mean, there's really no debating that. And, and he's really one of the guys that when you say who can really help their individual NFL stock between September 2023 and, and New Year's Day 2024, Dixon's near the top of that list for me because I think he's going to get a lot of run and a very good defense. And his versatility is something that I know many Diaz is excited to really be able to exploit a little bit more against the opponents this year. So I'm going Dixon. Uh, let's jump over to our fourth question here, which is the freshmen who are going to have an impact. And I guess we could probably spend a little bit less time on this one because it's a shorter this list than it was going into last season, I think. And, and there's less uh, notable positions in terms of guys are, are going to end up with the football in their hands. Last year, we knew you're going to see a lot of Nick Singleton. And you're going to see a lot of Katron Allen had all those wide receivers on campus and Abdul Carter was emerging. Uh, but but this one, I, I think we've got uh, Mark, you leading us off for this one, the freshman. Oh, am I wrong? I'm leading us off. <laughs> well, I guess I'm leading us off. I, I, I Did I not send you guys this question? Mark, Mark. you're muted. <laughs> Mark, Rightfully you're muted. so. I don't recall getting this question, but I, I will. Well, you know what? That's we can my wing mess it. up. We can wing no, 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 no. it. Well, we can wing it. Fine. Fine. That, then, then I didn't get to you, but let's jump into it right now. I put two, I put a few extra here. That's what I'm seeing because me and Daniel had a few lined up for last episode. So let's dive into this question. We'll stash another question for next episode because this one's simple enough. There's not a ton of names. And, and Mark, you'll lead us off because I imagine that you were. And, and I'll go second and Daniel can round it out. Yeah. Now that I've figured out how to unmute myself, uh, I'm going <laughs> to go, which my wife would probably like that button, you know, to, to, to do it. But yeah, I'll go with Rojas. I mean, I think it's probably low hanging, low hanging fruit. But uh, you know, just the things that we talked about before, you know, has come in um, and just transformed himself physically. I think he really uh, you, you hate to see it happen for the reason that happened. But there were so many injuries in the in the linebacker room in the spring. So many guys were out, whether for pre precautionary reasons or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but the benefit of that is that a guy like Rojas was able to get an absolute ton of snaps. So I think you're going to see him in that rotation. Again, knock on wood, hopefully nobody gets bumped up. But if somebody does get bumped up, I think they'll be able to move things around and get, you know, you'll see him play even more. And I also think with his athleticism, you know, outstanding high school running back. Uh, so that that talks about how uh, how athletic that the kid is. 
I think that that he is going to be another one of those guys who can make a real impact on special teams. We've seen some young linebackers through the years make impacts on special teams, and I think he's going to be one of them. So I think Rojas, to me, uh, is really the, the, the easiest one of, of all these. I don't think you're going to have a player – I don't think this class is going to project the way last year's freshman class did, but that's almost an unfair standard with the number of players who just, you know, exploded out of the gates from that class. So if you don't see them exploding, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that last year was an outlier. Well, all right, let's uh, let's get to me. And and by the way, check your text. This was included on the list. I, di- I didn't think I was going crazy. It was right there in between under the radar player and most improved player. And I did have the order right. So, uh, OK, I, I thought it was there somewhere in the back it's of sort my of making brain. excuses. <laughs> no, no, no that, that's not an excuse. I got, you guys got to check your check your lenses, I guess. But look, with freshman impact, I'm going to go Elliot Washington. Again, I don't see much of a, a starter level impact outside of maybe Tony Rojas as the season goes on, and it's hard to see where he's going to get those starters reps. But I, I think Elliot Washington, because not only does he have that speed that we talked about, sub four four forty yard dash, he's got the size. Uh, King Mack has a ways to go. That's why I'm a little wary of jumping on on him for this answer. Uh, same with Zion Tracy, although he's more physical than I imagined he would be based on feedback from his first month in pads. He missed the spring, but I'll go Washington because he's you know pushing towards 200 pounds at five foot 11. So I'm tracking the ball down a bit at, at the last open practice. And when you match that with four, three, something speed, we're going to find a role for you, whether it's on defense or special teams. So I think ultimately when you combine snap totals from defense and special teams, uh, I'm going to say that he makes the, the next biggest impact behind Rojas, who I think is the obvious nod um, with a caveat that any of those offensive players, we said are, they're kind of a ticking time bomb because of the position room they're in London, Montgomery, Cam Wallace, Andrew Rappelier, over on offense, they're buried behind some high talent. But if something happens, goes awry, keep an eye on those names. Daniel, finish us off with freshmen. And then we've got one more question to get to before we, we speak with Chris Anderson about West Virginia. Yeah, I'm going to stay in the defensive backfield. Uh, and it's, you know, King Mac or Zion Tracy. Those are kind of the, I think, the two top picks right here based on you know what we've heard and what James Franklin talked about today. But I yeah, and like you said, Tyler, I mean, I've been surprisingly impressed with Zion Tracy and what we've seen with, you know, being able to be physical, being able to get onto the field and be able to be in this spot after not uh, playing in the spring. But I'm going to go with King Mack. We've heard a little bit about the positional versatility. Um, I think that that's something that can really benefit. And you know, I think the one thing that really stands out about college football you know, doesn't matter the conference, doesn't matter the level, is that if you've got speed, they're going to try to figure out a way uh, to get you onto the field. They're going to try to figure out a way, you know, to put you in a position to make something happen. And you know, we've heard good things about King Max speed. So I think that's something that can help get him into the mix. Um, the size is interesting to see what exactly that will look like. Um, but, you know, seeing number nine on some coverage teams this year, um, I think he should definitely be in the mix and it won't be a surprise to see him out there. And he was in that mix as a kickoff returner as well, a guy who just dominated the fields of South Florida on special teams. Um, All right, last question here, and I'm going to stash that that most improved player for our season preview episode slash West Virginia preview episode uh, come Thursday. We'll give you our MVP picks on both sides of the ball. We'll break down our season prediction picks and, of course, our scores for the West Virginia matchup. But finishing off this conversation, which member of the 2022 recruiting class will break out? We just spent this time focused on the 2023 freshman class. We got such a long look at those first year players last year, double digit total of, of burned red shirts by the end of the 2022 season. You had the big 10 freshman of the year. You had a preseason all American over at linebacker as well. Um, when we look at this group in 2022, among guys that haven't stepped up to the plate and haven't really taken that big role yet, but might do it now. Uh, where do we land with this with this group? And and I'm forgetting who leads this one off. I'll own that one. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's on me this time. And there we go. Uh, I I mean I think I'm going to keep it pretty simple here uh, in terms of someone who hasn't necessarily stepped up into a very prominent starting role, and that's Drew Aller. Um, I think that he is you know, he's going to touch the ball every play. You know, we think we know uh, what kind of talent he is. He is that five star, whether it's first quarter against West Virginia, you know, maybe in November against Maryland, or even not until the Michigan game, you know, where we see him reach that potential. I think that it is definitely within reach for him. Uh, I think the feedback that we've been getting from his teammates in terms of the 
not only the type of ball that he throws, but then some of the windows that he's been able to fit it into. And you know, the fact that the defensive backs have really picked up on the fact that it's difficult going against him. Um, I, I think that it really speaks to what Aller, uh, you know, can cap- can be capable of. Um, and I think that he's the key to Penn State's ceiling. You know, I think that if Penn State is able to you know, reach the heights that some people think they can, you know, we've seen them in the college football playoff uh, recently in a couple of projections, you know, it's going to come down to Aller, you know, playing like the quarterback that people believe that he can be. Of course, he's got to be named the starter first. So well, I guess we can return to that in a little bit. Or he doesn't need to be named the starter. And again, he just shows up and says, I'm here for work. I'm the starting quarterback and give me the ball. Uh, Mark, your next pick and I'll, I'll finish this off before we shift gears and focus over to the Mountaineers. Yeah, I did want to apologize. We're having some work done. That's why I'm muting and unmuting. And it, so I, I just didn't want to. Uh, and it was my bad. I went back and look at the text and Tyler did send it. I was looking at the wrong list. So that was on me as well. So We've Tyler, got a lot of texts going off, around these days. It's a game. It's a game week. There's a lot of information being shared. It's well, okay. We're having stuff done. I'm not in my usual podcast place. <laughs> my my uh, dungeon of podcasting. I'm actually in a sunlit place and I'm all confused, but I'm not confused on this one. <laughs> I'm going to go with KJ Winston. Would not be surprised if he Good also thing. emerges as a starting safety and you know, that's saying a lot because if I'm saying Jalen Reed's going to be a starting safety and KJ Winston, remember, you know, we had Keaton Ellis start every game last year. So I think this is a guy who's really elevated his game. Uh, and he did it uh, through, throughout the offseason. And then in camp, he really stepped up. I think he's one of their most physical uh, players. I think he has cornerback skills if he needs them. But I think you're going to see him as a starting safety who gets a lot of things done. They're going to play four safeties. So, so if you're a Keaton Ellis fan, uh, you know, from State College, I'm also from State College, love Keaton Ellis. But I think KJ Winston from that 2022 class is a guy who really has an opportunity to step up and really establish a name for himself uh, this season. I said 2022 recruiting class. Uh, speaking about freshmen, I would go Caden, Caden Saunders here. I, I think he's going to give you a, a little bit of a dynamic here. I don't know if it's going to be a 30-plus reception kind of season, but he's a guy who I think w- they'll find a way to get him touches, and he could be a really interesting weapon for this team, kind of a supplemental piece in the passing game, short passing game in particular, where he can use that explosiveness. But just general, the reason I phrased it as recruiting class, I wanted to leave the door open for maybe one of us picking J.B. Nelson, yep. um, who you could go for maybe under the radar, although that's kind of been blown up here the last couple of weeks. I think people are getting more familiar with Landon Tengwall's situation, what J.B. N- uh, Nelson's importance is. And I, I think – Starting on Saturday night, we're going to see exactly why everyone's been point, you know, tapping on your shoulder about J.B. Nelson for months now, about how he's developed, the aggression. And I think they're going to want to you know, go run heavy uh, to, to an extent in this game, and, and that suits J.B. Nelson well. The tone setter, the nature that we've heard about him, I want to see if that's on display against the Mountaineers. And if it is, I, it's going to be hard to get him out of this lineup, no matter what Landon Tangwell is able to do. I think we're going to see a lot – of J.B. Nelson over the course of this season. There's a lot of guards to talk about, but James Franklin and, and this coaching staff, they plan on playing J.B. Nelson before Landon Tangwell had to be had to step to the side. And now that's, you know, that raises even further when you look at his outlook. So he's my pick there. Fun conversation. We got some more questions to follow for our episode that's going to come Thursday. By the time we get to there, we'll have another look at Penn State practice. A ton of coverage. We're in game week mode at lines247.com. VIP subscription available now, 30% off for an annual deal or $1 for one month and enjoy the first few games here. See how we approach game weeks. Uh, Very detailed manner over at lines247.com. Daniel, Mark, appreciate the perspective as always. Thanks, Tyler. Yep, have fun with Chris. He'll do a great job. He does a great job for our our network So, and, and for the West Virginia site. Good stuff. We'll get into it right now with Chris Anderson from West Virginia coverage and uh, your sports. And hey, nice to have you on. I think you caught the the end of our conversation there. We're obviously excited to see this team play somebody else. And the team happens to be the West Virginia Mountaineers coming up here. Kickoff 730. A lot of eyes are going to be on this matchup. Uh, But Chris, first and foremost, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Tyler. Uh, It's going to be a pretty short podcast since neither of us know who's going to play in this weekend's game is that right <laughs> that's yeah no starters have been named in happy valley and and i know we can start there with you um quarterback was also a question that was posed to head coach neil brown down in your way and you guys don't exactly have any more clarity on a tuesday do you nope same answer he said he's already gone this far why not continue to roll with it uh, i think was the exact term he used but i believe 
you know, West Virginia fans are in the same situation as Penn State fans, and that there seems to be an obvious answer. Just nobody wants to say it out loud. I believe James Franklin said today he's expecting Garrett Green. Uh, everybody in Morgantown is expecting Garrett Green. He, it's been pretty clear uh, from what we were able to see in the spring, what we were able to see in the summer, and even into what, what little bit we were able to see from fall camp practice that he just seems more refined, more ready to go out there and play right now than redshirt freshman Nico Marchio. Let's talk a little bit about the situation that, that, that West Virginia finds itself in. I mean, is there a lame duck vibe around Neil Brown right now? Uh, you know, a lot of people thought he wouldn't be around. Uh, he is. Maybe that's awkward. Is the team going to be good enough to save his job? How does it shape up as we close out August? What needs to happen for Neil Brown to remain the Mountaineers head coach in 2024? It's funny because what, what does need to happen? I don't, I don't think there's a set – number a bowl game you know number of wins something like that new athletic director ren baker keeps talking about the, the feel the vibe in type of, in, inside the athletic department in the uh, push car center where the football team's located and and what he's getting from the team when he goes in you know he just showed up this off season uh did a quick very quick kind of overview of what what was happening and what needed to be fixed and a lot of that was centered around nil to help retain talent and acquire talent um, I don't know if they did better retaining talent because they still lost quite a number of staffs from last year, but they did a better job of acquiring it in the transfer portal. So I, I don't know if, a, once again, Neil Brown's kind of getting this clean slate from the athletic department, but he certainly doesn't have one from the fan base. And I, I think that could come to a head here. Of, you know, if this team finishes, say, six and six, in the eyes of athletic director Ren Baker, that might be good enough, especially if things are trending in the right direction. But in the fans' eyes, that's you know that's five years of, of nothing and, and of five hundred ball, and they're not going to live with it. Neil Brown came came to town after three consecutive years at Troy, where he goes ten plus victories. Uh, he looked at what the the track record thus far with West Virginia five and seven in twenty nineteen. The best season win loss wise was that pandemic impacted 2020 campaign. They went six and four, uh, finished with the Liberty Bowl victory. But since then, six and seven with a guaranteed rate bowl loss and then five and seven in 2022. What has been, I guess, the consistent calling card, maybe the disappointing aspect of Neil Brown's uh, program leadership and, and, and what you've seen on the field that that maybe could be apparent as soon as this Saturday? And if you see it show up again during those 60 minutes of football, you're going to be thinking, we're just on the slippery slope toward the finish line now. Well, it has to be offense. You know, he he made his way up the college ranks as an offensive coordinator. And when he arrived, there was never a thought that that would be the problem. And instead, it's been like no matter the quarterback, they've changed quarterbacks almost every year. Uh, they've changed offensive coordinators almost every year. And, and no matter they changed who was called the plays, whether it was the offensive coordinator, whether it was Neil Brown, whether guys were working together. And no matter what they've done, they've never found a clear answer to get the offense moving. And I think that's the most disappointing thing. And the thing that's going to and has so far kind of marred his time in Morgantown. Uh, you, you don't come to a head coaching job known as an offensive coordinator and not be able to produce offense. Because the defense up until last year had been anywhere from good to great. So it's kind of been the offense that hasn't lived up to what it needs to be. I want to talk about offense more in a bit, but there's some familiar names on this West Virginia roster for our audience out there. Fatorma Molba spent a few years here as a defensive lineman, hit the transfer portal after the Rose Bowl last winter. Lance Dixon was a five-star in 24-7 sports assessment coming out of high school in Michigan, ended up at, at Penn State for a brief period of time before hitting the transfer portal. And then Rodney Gallagher, a freshman down in West Virginia, was one of those prized in-state prospects that we spent a lot of time on this podcast, breaking down his recruitment over the last couple of years. He ends up in a Mountaineers uniform. Can you give us a bit of a progress report on all three of those guys, where they stand right now with their West Virginia careers at kind of different phases? Uh, Mulba, maybe in the rotation, I think, you know, Penn State fans are probably not surprised by this, but he, he is a massive man that is hard to move. Uh, he is a true nose, nose guard, nose tackle type, but uh, he has not been somebody that I've heard kind of in that, that first – kind of round of backups. So he might be like the sixth, seventh guy that gets in there because defensive line coach Andrew ja A.J. Jackson, who also a familiar name to Penn State fans, um, he says he wants eight. So Mobile might be in that eight. Uh, going to Lance Dixon, he started out as a will linebacker and essentially was kind of deemed not big enough to really truly be a linebacker, got moved out to this spear, 
position, which is like a linebacker cyber uh, safety hybrid, and probably backup spot there. He'll play quite a bit. He's he's bounced back and forth between starter and backup over the past year, uh, and, and then Gallagher. You know, the coaches have said they were surprised by how ready he was to do all the other stuff. I Meaning, of course, like you know, he's an athlete. He can catch and he can move and he can run, but he was ready and willing and able to to block, to run block. Um, to, to work on special teams and do different things. And Neil Brown said earlier this week that Rodney Gallagher will play for this team on Saturday and will play, be part of the rotation at receiver and part of special teams throughout this season. I mean, very interesting. I know a lot of people here in the Penn State community anticipated his first college game would open up in Beaver Stadium, but as a member of the Nittany Lions, not as the road team. So we'll see what kind of an impact he makes. When we look at this offense overall, I guess Gallagher could fit the bill if things go according to plan for the coaching staff. But who were some potential spark plugs? You talked about the quarterback position, but when it's time to spread the football, who were some guys that could do some damage you know, with limited opportunities on the field for, for West Virginia? Well, I think – you know, at, uh, on offense, C.J. Donaldson is going to be the guy, I think, at, at running back. You know, he was a freshman All-American, but got dinged up with a uh, lower leg injury, got dinged up with a concussion. So you never really got to see his full potential last season. And and that it was even more than that because the coaches have talked about it and he's changed his body. He would basically get two runs, three runs, and then he'd be exhausted and have to come off the field. I mean, he was a true freshman that had never played running back before. He, he was a converted tight end. So he just wasn't in shape to kind of handle the, the full load as a running back. Now he's supposed to be. He is. I mean, he looks different. This year. Uh, we'll see how, how it happens come game time. But he's going to be the guy that they will lean on on offense, especially with that run game and all five starters back on the offensive line. Wide receiver. Your guess is as good as mine. I, mean, I think it's going to be NC State for uh, Devin Carter, but the top four receivers for West Virginia from last season are gone to the NFL in the transfer portal, and the top four, maybe even the top five or six guys, uh, that will be five of the top six guys for this year right now in the, in the depth chart, are going to be new transfers. So it's all new faces there, and, and we'll see how, it's, how it shakes out. And Devin Carter is a guy that we thought we'd be covering here for, for a brief period of time. He was committed to Penn State oh. out of the transfer portal from NC State, and he ends up at West Virginia. So there's another bit of a familiar name connection. How about on defense? Uh, we're expecting Penn State. We want to see what it looks like with this new starting quarterback situation, but expecting them to be able to lean on a lot of different weapons across the field. What are the game record potential players for, for West Virginia's defense who can counter some of that? I think it, it starts and ends with Lee Koba in the middle of that defense, uh, the Mike linebacker. He's a massive man, just an absolute – when you see him in person, he is a massive human being playing in the middle of that defense. And he's uh, one of those – I don't even know if he'll be a thing anymore, but bounce back transfers, started at Syracuse, went to junior college in West Virginia, recruited him from there. Um, he started last year. He's kind of – or last year was kind of reckless, would have ended up in the wrong gaps. But he's so athletic and so big that a lot of times he still made plays. He would still lead the team in tackles. He would still disrupt things. And I think they're relying on him to continue to do that, but also refine his knowledge of the game and not get out of position quite as much. So I think that the biggest guy they're going to lean on is him. Uh, defensive line, as Coach Jackson said, which is worrisome to me, you know, they're solid. He's not sure they have the game breaker, the, the habit creator, like they've had in, in Dante Stills, Darius Stills, and Akeem Messier for past years. But he expects him to be solid. That doesn't instill a lot of confidence. I'm not sure who they're going to expect to make a big difference there. And, and then in the secondary, you have all new guys. You're, you're rolling in a lot of new transfers. Uh, I would say that uh, Beanie Bishop, transfer from Minnesota, is a guy that they're going to expect to make a difference and kind of be one of those guys they hope can lock down the side of the field at corner. Uh, and when you kind of just uh, anal uh, analyze this team moving forward into this matchup, what are your expectations for this season? Um, and I, I know you cover this team as close as anyone and uh, not just for this game, which I'll get to in just a moment, but what do you realistically see being uh, within reach for this West Virginia team? And then if it goes awry, where's the floor? Um, the floor is, is, I mean, below the basement, unfortunately, because the way this schedule is set up, and the feeling around the program and the fan base, things could go south. I mean, this, this Penn State game to start, let's be realistic about it. It's a three-touchdown underdog. I don't think too many West Virginia fans are expecting to come in and, and get this win in Happy Valley. 
Uh, the following week, Duquesne, count that as a win. All right, so you're one and one, and then that's where you circle that pit game at home. And if West Virginia loses that game, they follow that with Texas Tech, which is a top 25 team. They follow that with a trip to last year's national championship runner-up TCU. And then they go Houston at Houston with former head coach Dana Holgerson. And I'm, I mean, you can see a scenario here where West Virginia is was that one and five, and you've just lost to two rivals and your former coach. I don't think morale could get any lower than that point. And, and even though the schedule eases up a bit in the second half of the year, things might be too far gone by that point. Now, you win that pit game, you got Texas Tech at home. Maybe you get that one too, and all of a sudden you got a little momentum heading to TCU. Uh, and the Horn Frogs, granted, you know they lost a lot of guys. They brought in a lot of guys, and all of a sudden you could be looking at, you know, four or five and one, and, and taking down your former coach in Houston, and things could be riding high. I still think the max is like eight wins for this team. I, I just don't think they have the depth or the talent to really do much more than that. But as far as the basement, oh, like legitimately two and 10 could be in play if things go wrong. Well, let's see. Uh, if you look at what Vegas is serving up for this game and you kind of take the temperature of this matchup, it feels like a game where our listeners are going to be fairly comfortable come the fourth quarter, late night Saturday on the way to one and zero. But tell me how it shapes up the scenario where everyone's sitting on the edge of their seat. West Virginia's got everybody on upset alert here on Saturday. How does that happen for West Virginia? And then ultimately, tell me how you see this one playing out uh, a few days ahead of kickoff. How it happens is Garrett Green and his ability to make something out of nothing when the play breaks down. Breaks one, maybe two plays a score here, a score there. And then West Virginia is able to rely on their offensive line, which again, all five starters back from a group that really pro football focus had like 30th last year. So just outside the top 25, you return everybody and you got a whole stable of running backs that have experience and guys that you can trust. And, and then maybe you can kind of ride that and these new clock rules and, and shorten the game. And, and that's just enough to happen because something that's again, marred this Neil Brown era has been the inability to do anything on offense and specifically get big plays. Uh, West Virginia, as far as like 40 plus yard plays, 30 plus yard plays, they were ranking 105th, 110th out of 130 teams over the last four years, each of the last four years. There's no wow. exception to that. And last year was no different. They only had eight plays of 40 plus yards all season long. The good news is three of them came in the last two games when, um, they, they kind of changed this offense around Garrett Green and got things going. The third game, too, against Oklahoma uh, and had several 30-plus yard plays. So there, there's a hint, a chance that with his mobility and his arm strength, they could get a few of those big plays, and, and maybe that's how it happens. And so that's the, the, the good scenario. The, the, that's the promising scenario yeah. when you say, okay, let's put on, the, the, let's put on our clear vision here. Not looking at the clear, not looking at the optimum solution. What do you think is the realistic outcome uh, on Saturday for this matchup? I think Penn State's too good of a team to rely on one quarterback uh, to make all the difference like that. I, I don't think Green can. I don't think one or two plays is going to cut it against Penn State, um, especially with the defense. You know, you know, we don't know what West Virginia's defense is going to be. Again, they've been good to great for three years, and then last year they were abysmal. Uh, and they got a bunch of new guys in that secondary. And I just don't know how well it's going to hold up. And I just don't know if you can rely on kind of an inefficient model on offense and hope for a couple big plays from the quarterback to make a difference. So if you were to ask me, you know, pick, pick a score, pick, pick what happens. I think maybe Green gets a, a score early, gets some excitement for West Virginia, but then they just can't seem to get anything going, keep, keep some drives going. Uh, and that's really all that they could muster was one or two big plays from Green, and it ends up something like 31 to 13, 31 to 16, something like that. Chris Anderson uh, covers West Virginia for 24-7 sports at Ear Sports. Appreciate your perspective. We'll see what happens when the, when these coaches start players and play the players on Saturday, and, and we'll get a, a good look at these teams finally. Thank you very much for the time. Yeah, no problem. 
All right, good stuff from Chris. Uh, prior to him, Mark Brennan and Daniel Gallen uh, from our 24-7 Sports Arsenal. We'll have those guys back on for a closer look at this matchup from a Penn State perspective with our second episode of the week. We'll also bring on Tyler Calvaruso, our resident recruiting expert, because this is shaping up to be a really important and potentially impactful Saturday for Penn State on the recruiting trail as that guest list has continued to grow with prospects from within the region and beyond. And in between these podcasts and all week long leading up to kickoff, head over to lines247.com for the latest from conversations with Penn State coaches and players. We'll get another look at practice this week as well. So a lot coming your way over at the site as that recruiting list continues to grow. You'll get the latest on those confirmations as well. Saying goodbye for now, I'm Tyler Donahue. This has been the Lions 24-7 podcast.